Good morning and good afternoon. Um, welcome to the hazards analysis and risk assessment according to ISO 26262 webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Fernando Valera. I'm CTO at Visual Solutions and I will be conducting today's webinar. Uh, throughout the meeting you will be muted. Uh, you will find at the right hand side panel a, a questions, uh, questions and answers panel. Uh, please feel free to post your questions there. Uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, we will leave 15 minutes for a Q&A and we will be addressing all of your questions. This webinar is one hour webinar and um, we will be covering some of the general, uh, general uh, topics and general uh, definitions in ISO 26262. Uh, especially uh, those regarding part three um, and have to do with the hazards analysis and risk assessment. And then we will go into um, a demo of visual requirements and how we can automate some of these activities inside uh, visual requirements. Um, I'll start with a very brief description of the company, who we are, uh, visual requirements, uh, visual solutions for those of you who have never heard about us. It's a, a uh, company focused on providing solutions around requirements engineering. So that's the only thing we do. We have uh, more than 15 years experience in, in providing those solutions. And uh, we provide as part of those solutions visual requirements. So visual requirements is our um, product for requirements management, requirements analysis, and of course um, hazard analysis and, and risk, uh, risk assessment. We have our headquarters in San Francisco, which is where I'm currently located, and that's the reason for me saying good morning. It's still 10 o'clock in here. Good afternoon for those of you in the East Coast. Um, um, uh, as part of this uh, requirement to getting portfolio solutions, we, we provide the IREP training. Uh, the IREP uh, training is a certification um, on um, on requirements management. It stands for International Requirements Engineering Board and this is certified uh, to provide this training worldwide. Apart from this uh, offices here in San Francisco, we have offices in London, in Madrid, and in Munich. So if any of you is attending from outside of the US, uh, uh, don't hesitate to contact us and we will redirect you to the corresponding um, colleagues in any of those offices. So let's start, take a look at the ISO 262, some, some general overview of the standard. Um, it, it applies to safety related systems that include one or more electrical uh, or electronic components in uh, production passenger cars. So we were all aware of this uh, and as you will probably know, it belongs to a family of uh, functional safety standards uh, that most of them derive from the IEC 61508, uh, which, then, which is the standard for uh, functional safety of electronical, um, electrical, and programmable electronic safety related systems. Um, within this uh, family of functional safety standards, we can also find another another standard very very common, uh, such as the um, 62304 for medical devices. Uh, there are some other standards for railroads, uh, and uh, um, some of them share some of the aspects, uh, as we will see today. And some of uh, some aspects are specific to each one of the standards. In this case, uh, in the case of uh, 60, uh, 262 um, standard provides an automotive safety life cycle, uh, which means that it uh, adds steps to your current development process, uh, some activities throughout the life cycle, as we will see. And it provides an automotive specific hazard analysis and risk assessment by the so-called ACL levels, the automotive uh, safety integrity levels. We will take a look at it uh, in more detail later on today. Um, the, the standard is divided into 10 parts, starting from the vocabulary, uh, management of the uh, functional safety, 
and uh, the parts in terms of the uh, development life cycle, starting from the concept phase, as we can see at the right hand side, uh, which is the part three, which is which is the one we will be concentrating on, and and the one that uh, specifically refers to the hazards analysis and risk assessment. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to remind you that uh, you have at the right hand side um, a question uh, a Q and A panel where you will be able to uh, you will be able to to uh, post all all your comments and at the end of the session I will try to address all of them. Uh, we already have some questions so like can I download a copy of the slides? Yes. Uh, we will make uh, uh, the slides and the and the recording available to to all of you. So uh, going back to the uh, V life cycle um, or the different parts in the uh, in the ISO 26262, uh, as you will have noticed, um, ISO uh, uses the V model as a reference for the different phases of the life cycle. Um, and uh, in this life cycle, we will start with the concept phase, uh, the product development. Uh, at a system level, at a hardware and software level, and then the production and operation. Um, as I mentioned, we will focus on the on the third part, but I would like to highlight a couple of aspects in the first part, which is the vocabulary, mainly because we will be referring to some of these um, elements throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar. The first one, it's uh, very interesting because uh, depending on the company, I've seen uh, different companies using these terms in different ways. Uh, this standard specifically um, references hazards as the potential source of harm. So this is the the, the bad stuff that can ha can happen. The risk is actually the probability of uh, this hazard of happening and uh, how bad it can get. Um, there there are some aspects specific to the standard, like item, which is basically the system or system of systems or function to which we need to apply the ISO 26262. There's also some other specific element, which is a safety goal. And the safety goals are top level safety requirements uh, that will come up out of the um, activity of the hazard analysis and risk assessment. So our safety uh, requirements that we will need to reach in order to comply with the, uh, with the uh, with this method. And the definition of the hazard analysis and risk and assessment uh, by the standard is, um, is basically the method uh, to identify and categorize hazardous events of items and to specify safety goals and ACLs related to the prevention or mitigation of these hazards in order to avoid unreasonable risk. So we more or less uh, um, we're familiar with this with this term, but uh, here we have the automotive safety integrity level definition, which is one of the four levels to specify the items, necessary requirements of ISO 26262 and safety measures for avoiding an unreasonable procedural risk, with D representing the most stringent and A the least one. So uh, for each one of the uh, of the hazards that we will be based on the uh, we will be based on the items, we will have to categorize them uh, with an AC level between A and D, four levels. Um, and this calculation is based on three main aspects. The first one, the exposure, which is the state of being in an operational situation that can be hazardous. So this means the uh, the um, of, of being in a specific situation which is harmful. The controllability, it's the avoidance of the specified harm through the timely reaction of the persons involved. So in the case of the car, that can be the driver. Um, how, um, how can the driver avoid that harm. And the severity is basically the harm that the um, hazard can actually cause the, uh, the driver or the passengers in the, in the car. So let's uh, take a look at the uh, 
part three in each one of the parts of it. The first one, the item definition, as, uh, as we mentioned previously, the different system or systems of systems or functions that uh, we will be basing our hazards analysis on. Um, I, I've just uh, chosen a, an example of an electric power steering. Um, basically, the steering wheel and, and uh, uh, the assistance uh, to the passenger. So this system is composed of several components, like the ECU, the power supply, uh, or the interface to the power supplies in, in some other aspects. The first thing will be identifying those items. Uh, so in our case, we will have things like uh, the ECU, the torque and angle sensor, the motor, the uh, another sensor, the control area network, some interfaces, uh, and so on. So the first thing is identifying those those items, making them available to everybody, uh, and move on to the to the next uh, step. The next step is the initiation of the safety life cycle. Um, so in this step, we will identify whether we are dealing with a new development or whether it's a modification of an existing development, in which case we will have to add some activities to the life cycle. Um, in our case, uh, let's switch to the, uh, it'll be a new development, and we want to start to, the, uh, to do the hazards analysis. So this phase, the hazards analysis and uh, risk assessment is composed of four different steps. Uh, the identification of the hazards, the classification, um, determining uh, the ACID level, um, and uh, creating the safety goals. So how do we uh, classify the hazards? Well, uh, we classify them based on the three concepts we introduced previously in the presentation. And those are the exposure, the controllability, and the severity. Out of these three aspects, we will calculate the ACID level, uh, and based on the ACID level, we'll have to generate the safety goals. So um, let's, uh, let's imagine, uh, let's go uh, to the first step, identifying the hazard. Uh, considering that we are talking about the uh, power of the electric power steering, um, imagine that one of the sensors in charge of the uh, steering wheel just uh, fails, and the steering wheel um, steers on its own. Um, so it corrects the direction, and instead of uh, having a straight line, the car basically steers to the left or the right. So that is um, an actual hazard that could that can happen. So we have to identify that, and that can be the result of uh, one of the items identified in the previous step of failing. Um, we would need to identify the different operational situations. Um, so what would happen if the, if the car uh, was basically parked? So there, there would be no, no hazard in, uh, at all because the car wouldn't be moving. So the operational situation in which the hazard applies is while driving on a freeway, driving on snow, um, and every other operational situation in which uh, the hazard can, can actually appear. And what is the impact of that uh, failure? Well, the impact is that uh, we, can, we can just uh, cross the lane and, and uh, collide with another user or another car, or we can actually uh, get off the road and uh, collide with a pedestrian or something like that. So uh, this is the identification of the hazard. Let's uh, uh, come up with the different uh, values for the exposure, controllability, and severity. Um, the probability of exposure is that uh, uh, what is the, um, and this is ranked between uh, 0 and 4, uh, in which 0 is incredible and 4 is high probability. So uh, how probable is it, uh, what's the probability that uh, whenever that happens, the um, the hazard um, will be 
in an operational mode that can actually cause some harm. Well, it happens that uh, most of the time we're actually driving the car uh, and we're maneuvering and using the steering wheel. Um, and that's, uh, let's say that uh, that's 90% of the time that we're actually using the car. So 90% is a high probability of, uh, of an exposure to, uh, to a, a harm if uh, the sensor uh, for, for any reason stops uh, working. What is the controllability? Um, so in our case, the electric power steer, uh, steer or steering wheel is um, taking control over the steering wheel over the driver. So uh, it'll be very difficult to control or the user won't have time enough to control it before the car goes into the other lane. So we will rank this controllability as a C3. And what, what's the severity? Uh, well, the severity, well, this is uh, very bad. <laughs> so um, if we collide with another car, uh, we will for sure have life-threatening injuries. Um, so that will be an S3. So according to what we just said, the probability of exposure will be an E4, our controllability will be a C3 and the severity an S3. So um, let's take a look at the ACIL level based on these three factors. So um, the way of calculating the ACIL level is, um, is through this, this uh, kind of table um, where we um, select the um, severity here, uh, which was S3. We uh, select the exposure, which was E4, and within this row we have C3, which is a D. D means uh, that it's the most stringent um, AC level, and therefore we will have to establish the highest um, priority and the highest uh, levels of, of security over this hazard. Um, for those of you who are familiar with um, other, um, other uh, risk uh, management techniques like FMEA, you will have noticed that this is uh, a table, whereas in FMEA, um, instead of exposure, severity, and controllability, you might have some other aspects like uh, occurrence, detection, can you calculate the risk priority number. Um, in other standards, uh, the risk priority number can be a calculation or just multiplying these three factors. And then you get a range, um, like for instance, between 0 and 20, uh, 20 and 40, uh, or uh, 40 and 80, and uh, beyond 80, it's an unacceptable risk. So whether the calculation is, um, is straight away from the uh, three factors or um, in the table here, what we need to look is for the ranges of unacceptable risk. Um, in this case, A, B, C, and D are risks that need to be managed. Um, we see QM, uh, which means that that risk is, uh, uh, can be managed exclusively or um, only with the standard quality management capabilities that we might have in our development process, and no additional safety procedures need to be uh, placed on top of the of this hazard. So uh, would be uh, would be considered as an acceptable risk, where the rest would have to be mitigated to some point. Let's move on um, and let's uh, 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 take a look at the result of this analysis. So basically, our um, our hazard has been ranked as a D, uh, the most stringent one. And now we just need to extract a safety goal, therefore. Let's, uh, let's say that uh, the EPS system shall not apply an unintended force to the vehicle steering system. OK, so just uh, as an example of a safety goal, um, we will just use that for, uh, for example. And the fourth step. Uh, the functional safety concept, which is no more than 
starting to derive the functional safety requirements uh, out of this, this fine safety goal and allocating them to the preliminary architectural elements. Uh, don't forget that after this phase, we will have the product development uh, at a system level and then uh, software at, at, a, and, um, at a hardware level, which means that uh, this uh, uh, functional safety requirements will have to be derived into functional software and functional hardware requirements at the same time. Um, the standard mandates that at least one functional requirement is allocated to each one of the safety goals, so we will have to guarantee that. But also, the um, um, functional requirements need to have at least the same ACID level as the safety goals. Um, so let's come up with a functional safety requirement, and let's say that the system shall revert to its safe state with manual steering between 20 milliseconds up to inception of a fault. Um, for instance, let's say that in 20 milliseconds, uh, the system detects that there is a fault, and the 20 millisecond is the fault tolerance in which the uh, user might be able to gain control of the car without going to another lane or um, getting out of the highway. So as I mentioned, this is just an example. Um, and let's go and um, and um, and um, see how we can automate this uh, these activities that we have just seen with visual requirements. I will introduce visual uh, through some slides, and then we will we'll go to the product and see um, the visual requirements uh, template for ISO two six two six two. So. Uh, what is it, what, what's visual requirements and what makes it different to the rest of the tools? Uh, the first thing is that we have a graphical way of representing the process. We want to help users follow the process instead of being a burden on top of the process. We want to uh, make absolutely clear to all the users in the system that we are having a, uh, let's say, an outcome definition. We're having a hazard analysis. We're having safety goals. We're having functional requirements, and that the element should be traced in one way or the other. Uh, for us, it's absolutely key making this available to everybody and create a structure out of it. The second aspect is the collaboration. Um, not only understood as distributed access to the information, because email is one of the most distributed capabilities ever. And sometimes it's the least collaborative of all tools I've ever used in my life. Um, so the collaboration is just uh, being able to present the right information to the right user in the right moment. Um, so that for the collaboration, we provide different roles, we provide different responsibilities, views, and um, uh, approval and review workflows. And the third aspect uh, we might not be able to cover today, but uh, Visual provides is the uh, quality analysis. We try to escape from being a, just a requirements management tool to be a requirements engineering tool, um, uh, helping improve the quality of your assets. Uh, that's uh, improving the quality of the requirements, analyzing them semantically, finding out um, low quality aspects, and raising a red flag whenever a requirement includes something like quick, uh, nice to have, um, uh, should be performant. And there's some B with terms that we should be avoiding. Also, if two requirements contradict, contradict each other, or there is an inconsistent use of you. Uh, on top of that, uh, if we have uh, high quality assets, we would like to reuse them throughout the different products. Good. Um, and just to um, finish off, the, the way in which we do that is uh, escaping from what we call the document-oriented approach, which is basically uh, the way in which we used to manage our music years ago by uh, folders and, um, and let's say, uh, allocating elements inside those folders. The problem with that is that the information is allocated to one single place um, and exclusively within one context. What we want to do is escape from that approach. We need to be 
uh, we need to provide an information oriented approach and having documents as inputs and outputs of our system we will always have uh, to generate a software uh, requirement specification with uh, current specification of course but that is not the main purpose of our management um, our main purpose is to deal with the information and the traceability in there the way we do it is through this graphical uh, representation as I, as I mentioned previously um, this are, these are diagrams that you will find in our product we can represent things like item definition the hazards uh, the safety goals functional safety requirements hardware and software safety requirements so uh, if anybody sees this diagram um, they will quickly understand what's the process and what are the steps uh, to follow this uh, hazard analysis process um, however we've got other points of view of the system uh, we might have another point of view which is the uh, system decomposition for the um, functional uh, safety requirements we had to allocate them to the uh, preliminary architectural um, representation. So we, we would be able to represent the, uh, the scope of our uh, system in the same type of diagrams, which means that we could allocate uh, a requirement as being a functional safety requirement and belonging to the steering wheel, belonging to uh, the seats, belonging to the engine, or belonging to any of the components. That means that uh, we can categorize requirements as, a, as different types by uh, tags instead of just hard pasting that requirement inside a spec we just categorize them in a different way so that we will be able to pull all the safety requirements from all the different specs and uh, perform this hazard analysis in, a, in an appropriate way but from uh, helping us organize and classify the information this diagram allow us, allows us to integrate with other tools so um, for this process, uh, we will, uh, uh, to comply with the um, ISO 26262, we will definitely need to uh, verify the requirements, uh, software and hardware requirements. And for that, we will need to integrate with tools like uh, um, LDRA, uh, vector software for the uh, software requirements, or uh, integrate with Cadence uh, for the hardware verification of the hardware requirements and so on. So we need to make sure we integrate with the right tools to be able to follow the flow of the development. So let's uh, switch to this requirements and, and let's take a look at the, um, at the tool and how this works. This is visual requirements. Um, I'll open the ISO 26262 project and um, I'll go through the different steps uh, uh, we've seen in the, in the presentation. So the first thing I'll do is that I'll show uh, the block diagrams and the block diagrams are the diagrams I was just uh, talking about where we identify the different element types uh, like item definition the hazards the safety goals functional safety requirements and so on so the fact that we have this representation this graphical representation it means that we are creating the project structure um, and I would like to take the opportunity right now to remember you that um, at the right hand side you will find a questions panel where you can post all your uh, questions, comments. I will leave some time at the end of the presentation to, to address all of them. Uh, coming back to the project, um, if, uh, if I indicated here that we've got an item definition if I right click on top of this box and um, open it, what I'm actually doing is going to the actual item definition in my project. So uh, what we see here are the different um, items we came up with during the, uh, during the process, like uh, the uh, ECU, the control area network, and any other component or system or system or system or uh, interface I need to take into consideration for this process. So uh, these diagrams will um, highly um, 
uh, structure the project in order to follow the, the process. But these diagrams are combined with uh, what we call the views. Um, so visual requirements ISO 26262 template not only provides the different element types, but also the views that will guide you through each one of the steps. So we've seen the item definition, and let's take a look at the um, second step, which is the ASIL view. Good. So in this view, we are identifying the different hazards. Uh, we are entering the name, uh, the different uh, uh, operational values, the failure impact, and the exposure, controllability, and severity. So let's create new one, a new one, and uh, and go through this process. So I'll select a hazard out of the list of available templates, and uh, I will just enter the uh, the name um, like uh, the steering assist uh, apply with um, Okay. So um, this would be the hazard, uh, the controllability. We said it would be a C3. The exposure uh, would be an E4. The severity, um, an S3, and let's say that the federal um, collision with uh, other vehicles. Okay. Perfect. So I have created my new hazard here. Um, I can um, actually do this with the team. Um, I can in change the uh, values. Let's say that the operational mode is driving, the operational situations, uh, driving in urban roads, uh, wet surface, um, downhill, uh, that's that's bad. <laughs> um, if, if uh, and this is interesting, and it could be another hazard, if the steering wheel um, and you, the changes and your parking in San Francisco downhill, uh, you might actually get a ticket. It's not life threatening unless you get a whole bunch of tickets. In that case, yeah, you can be in a terrible situation. Let's just say um, freeway, something like this. Good. Perfect. So uh, we have entered all the values uh, for the hazard. Uh, so we, we might have had several meetings with the team. We have uh, decided this, that this is the way we want to do it. Uh, these are the different values. And what we can see here at the right hand side is that the ASA level is calculated automatically. Automatically. It became a D. So what if I change this to, let's say, a C1? Uh, it changes automatically to a B, as you can see. Let's just change it back to a C3. Um, so based on our decisions, we can see what's the ASA level here. Good. So um, interesting thing is that at any point in time, we can just click on the Excel button. Everything gets uh, exported um, to Excel exactly as uh, as we're visualizing it in inside visual visual requirements. And here we have uh, the different assets. We would even be able to modify the Excel spreadsheet and import it back into Visual. I won't demonstrate it today, uh, but this would be a possibility. Let's um, let's go to the third step. Uh, the third the third step uh, that we saw in the stand was the safety tools. We just came up this with this um, hazard, um, and we saw that um, you know it, it can it can create a fatal um, and can have uh, catastrophic consequences. So we want we want to create a safety goal. Let's go to another view where we will actually see all the hazards in here. A similar view 
but uh, instead of just uh, visualizing the hazards, what we're visualizing um, are the related safety goals. Uh, and what we want to do in this view uh, for um, just uh, to be able to automate the process is creating safety goals out of the hazards. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a new element. And what I see is that because I have a hazard selected, I'm able to create a safety goal um, automatically traced to this hazard. So I'll click on OK. The, um, the code is automatically proposed. Uh, the name, uh, let's just uh, put the, the, the EPS uh, system. Um, first, the vehicle steering system, for instance. So I'll click on OK. Um, another very interesting thing. I have created a safety goal. The safety goal is automatically traced to the selected hazard. But not only it is traced to the uh, automatically to the uh, to the hazard following our uh, flow, but it has also taken automatically the AC level. So what we're doing is that we're automatically propagating that AC level um, downstream. So if I had selected, let's say, this uh, element here, and I created a safety goal. The new safety goal would have an A level um, according to the propagation. So that is a step that we um, that we are automating in there. Perfect, perfect. Um, let's um, let's go a step beyond this and um, take a look at the functional safety requirements. So one of the things we we said we had to do was, uh, out of the safety goals, to have at least at least one safety requirement. So what we're going to do is that we're going to create a functional safety requirement out of the safety goal. So the interesting thing, uh, because I've selected a safety goal, the list of available items to create has changed. So now I cannot create a safety goal because I have a safety goal selected. The only thing I can create is a functional safety requirement. So let's click on OK. Um, and let's say something like uh, um, the system shall revert, um, let's say, transitioning to manual state. This is the name of the functional requirement. And here we've got the description of the requirement. So the interesting thing also about the template is that we can actually uh, propose to the users uh, default descriptions. So the system shall, and then I'll just um, revert to its uh, safe state of manual steering in no more than 20 milliseconds after the inception of a fault. And we'll delete the rest. There we go. So the functional safety requirement is uh, is created in here. Uh, we would be able to allocate it uh, to the different architectural parts through the properties panel in here, um, selecting, let's say, um, whether the element is a subsystem specification, system technical specification, a vehicle technical specification, and so on. Good. So uh, we've created this uh, vehicle um, 
structural safety requirement um, at a system level. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, uh, we are trying to escape from a document-oriented approach um, to go for an information-oriented approach. However, we definitely need to work with specifications, be able to generate documentation, um, and so on. So let's switch to another view where we will see elements instead of a uh, in an X and Y view uh, or in a traceability tree. What we want to do is um, review all the functional um, safety requirements in a spec-like view. Um, so this view displays requirements in a in a word-like view uh, as we would just uh, um, do in a normal way, and we would be able to create new elements uh, in here. Um, so we would be able to to actually um, create a software safety requirement out of it or um, you know, move the requirements around. Um, that's, uh, I create a new one. And this new requirement, I just copied and pasted, we can um, trace them, um, safety goals. We can trace it afterwards to the safety goals. So there are several ways of, uh, of creating requirements. One of them is uh, creating a requirement out of a previous element, as we did for the first functional safety requirement, or creating a requirement in a spec and tracing it afterwards uh, to whatever elements. So that's what we did. I just copied and pasted this one and uh, traced it to to the um, and traced it to the safety goal. Another very interesting thing, another very interesting thing that we see in this element that I just copied and pasted. So um, because I pasted the element inside the functional safety requirements, it inherited the attributes. And like the ACID level. So we just copied and pasted the D. Uh, but what about the review status? Uh, why didn't it just uh, copy and paste the same value in here? Well, the, uh, the element um, or the elements in here actually take a workflow, uh, a review and approval workflow. So if this element was postponed, uh, this element cannot be created from scratch straight in the postponed state because it will have to go through the whole status of, of approval uh, from draft to be reviewed uh, from uh, to be reviewed to um, reviewed let's say and then from reviewed we can transition to postpone or accept or, or, or reject it for instance so this is a um, workflow process that we can define in the tool and it um, we can create whatever states we want and whatever transitions we want. Not only that, but we, we can indicate who's authorized to make that specific transition, like, for instance, the system engineers. Um, and that applies to each one of the steps. Additionally, we can associate the small script to automate tasks, such as sending an email, so that whenever we transition a requirement in to, to be reviewed state, uh, somebody will receive an, an email. Great. Um, apart from this, we can also export uh, all the information straight to Word. Um, we can select a dot, dot template or a dot, dot x template and, um, and simply um, um, generate those, those reports. Okay. So this, uh, um, this spec has the visual requirements format. And here we can have um, you know, a standard requirement specification um, out, of, um, out of that. Good. Um, we're almost at the end of the presentation. Um, just um, uh, feel free to to uh, post your questions there. Um, I'll 
would just like to mention um, uh, one more thing, one last thing, and uh, that's the report. So we just saw that uh, we are able to export information to Word and Excel, but we might need some more complex reporting. Um, we might have, uh, or we might want to uh, generate a report to find out which safety goals are not being met by uh, functional safety requirements as stated by the standard. So what we can do is generate this type of reports to demonstrate that all the elements are actually traced. So for instance, I trace this element to the safety goal, um, and here we see some, some safety goals that are not traced to any um, functional safety requirements. And here we have the uh, analysis of the overall uh, traceability. We've got uh, four orphan elements, uh, which is 50%, and here we see a chart. And then we can just export it to PDF, HTML, RTF, Word, Excel, and so on. Um, some of the reporting, um, like the hazard analysis. So the template actually includes um, Um, actually includes these two reports. Generate perfect. So here we've got the different ACE levels, uh, the different hazards, the safety goals, and we will be able to actually click and go to the element from the report straight into visual requirements. Good. So it's um, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes left. Um, I would like to leave some time for Q&A. So please uh, feel free to post your questions in the panel at the right-hand side. So we have several questions. Um, so um, are we in any way affiliated with uh, with Oracle? Uh, no, we we're not affiliated with with Oracle. Uh, we do have um, we do have agreements with several companies to provide an overall solution, like uh, uh, with Cadence, uh, with uh, several third party companies for the integrations, but but not with with Oracle. Even though, uh, and I'll relate this to another question regarding the database and the structure. So, so Visher does have a uh, um, does have an integration, or is based on Oracle or SQL Server, so that the uh, so that the clients connect to the same database and everybody can can access the, the information in there. So, I have uh, uh, some more questions. The first one is: um, um, Is the template available uh, somewhere for download? It is uh, it is available, um, and um, and you can contact us. And we will be providing an evaluation environment, um, so it is not as downloadable straight from the website. But you can contact us, and we will be providing the the information. So we have another um, another question here. Um, you mentioned. Uh, about the uh, team impact analysis, so does Visual provide anything? Um, and we have another question uh, related to this: uh, How does Visual trace customer requirements? For example, updates. Okay, so I'll, I'll just address these two questions um, in the tool. Good. So um, we have the uh, the block diagrams that actually identify the elements and the traceability um, among them. So we can simply create something like um, customer requirements, customer needs, or or user requirements, 
and trace this to uh, whatever um, other requirements we might want to have. If we want to establish traceability, we simply need to uh, create a link in here. Um, satisfied by, for instance, and this will indicate that this element needs to be traced to this one. Um, the fact of creating this line in the diagram indicates that this is a relationship that is um, allowed in the system. So users will actually be able to follow that traceability. If I right click on it and select uh, this relationship as active, I will go to a trace matrix where I'll see the uh, one of the elements in one of the blocks in the rows. In this case, each one of the rows represents a safety goal and each one of the columns represents the target block which is the functional safety requirements. And an arrow indicates that that safety goal is covered by that um, functional safety requirement. The interesting thing about this matrices is that we can, for instance, filter to display only the uh, non-related safety goals, for instance. So here we've got four safety goals that um, are not traced to any functional safety requirement, which is completely unacceptable as per the, the standard. Um, but also, we can display that this whole traceability um, in a tree-like view. Let's go to this kind of view. So this view displays uh, all the traceability we have described in this diagrams in a tree. So in here, we've got this hazard. Um, and if we expand it, we will see that it's uh, traced to one safety goal. This safety goal is traced to several functional safety requirements. This functional safety requirement is traced to a software requirement. And this software requirement is traced to two different tests. And guess what? These tests are traced to uh, the execution. Um, and we are able to gather the execution of those tests uh, within the system to have a representation of the latest execution, fail, pass, um, to be able to find out whether the uh, requirement is met um, and whether the functional uh, safety requirement is met and whether the uh, hazard is appropriately mitigated or not. Um, so in this case, one of the tests failed. Um, I'll display the ACID level here. So the good thing is that um, this hazard is uh, QM, so this uh, test failed, so there's no problem at all. The problem would have been uh, failing a test associated to a D-level um, hazard, for instance. Good. Um, more questions? Um, can the tool be used to capture uh, test specifications and hardware software requirements or functional safety requirements? Okay, uh, so hopefully I've been able to address that that, uh, that question in, uh, in the previous view. So absolutely yes, we can represent the, uh, uh, the different requirements, the test cases, the hardware and software um, and the functional software requirements through the diagrams I just display, uh, I just showed. Um, uh, the interesting thing about that is that we do that graphically. So if we need to do changes, we can uh, do them whenever whenever we need. Um, there's another question: um, What test tools are integrated or support or supported by the tool? So. Uh, in terms of um, software uh, uh, software development um, and software verification, we integrate with uh, LD Array, with VectorCast. Uh, in terms of hardware verification, um, we will be uh, conducting a webinar with Cadence uh, and demonstrate how the integration with B Manager works to be able to retrieve 
of the results uh, and verify that the hardware requirements are met. Um, we have some other questions in there. Um, So is this requirement itself certified enough to be used in the safety critical processes as according to um, 26262? So that, that is a very interesting question. And actually, um, part number eight, the uh, supporting processes, uh, talks about the uh, tool qualification um, and the um, confidence level of the tools. So. A visual has been used in, in um, aerospace uh, and defense environments um, for DO-178B uh, processes, in medical devices, um, in automotive environments. So it is, it is uh, uh, a qualifiable tool. Uh, it has been qualified in the past, um, and, and it is definitely certifiable for the safety critical processes. Uh, we've got uh, some other questions. Um, when a change is made using the tool, how are the changes tracked and logged? That's, that is a very interesting question. Um, I'll try to address it in a, in a couple of minutes. It's, uh, it's actually um, uh, not the purpose of today's meeting. I will just give a highlight to answer that question but I will not cover um, the whole scope of that question. I will just give some, some hints. So how do we keep track of the changes? That is definitely an extremely important question. So what we provide is what we call, first of all, the uh, suspect links. And let me just activate that filter to demonstrate how, um, um, how this works suspect links um, related to other items, for instance. Save and I'll activate the color filter. Okay. Um, so I will just have to... Um, okay, perfect. So uh, this project doesn't have that, that capability activated yet, um, uh, so I'll have to switch to, to another project. I'll explain it uh, very briefly. The suspect links is basically a capability that allows not only seeing the elements that are impacted by a change, so let's say that we modify a requirement, uh, we can apply a filter and see uh, all the elements in a spec that were modified in the last week. That's perfect. Um, but one of the most interesting things is being able to identify elements that are impacted by one of those elements that were modified last week. And that's uh, what I was applying here um, in terms of the suspect links. So suspect links highlight in red um, the elements that are related to modified elements. Uh, the reason for not being displayed in here is because this is a, a, a feature that you can enable or disable. So in this project, uh, I disabled it because at the beginning, everything is changing. So typically, you reach a baseline and activate that feature. Otherwise, everything will be in red all the time. Uh, apart from that, we have a complete versioning capability at an individual level and at a baseline level. So we can change. Uh, we can track who changed what and when. Um, so whenever we check in an element uh, and check it out again, a new version is created. We can check when was that made, who made it. Uh, we can find the diff to see uh, what was modified, what was changed, and so on, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, we've got a minute left. Um, Uh, similarities, differences between Visher and DOS and Rectify, uh, can support ASO decomposition. Uh, too many, too many <laughs> questions um, and we run out of time. I really appreciate your, your time. Um, 
I will be more than glad to answer those questions. We do provide uh, a, a comparison metrics with, with DOORS, with Rectify, um, and th there were some answers that we were that I was not able to cover, like the integration with other tools, uh, Team Center, and, and so on. I, um, um, I, I think it was uh, a very interesting topic, and uh, a lot of questions came up. So um, I encourage you to get in contact with us. Uh, you can contact us through info at VentureSolutions.com. I, uh, if you have any technical questions, uh, please feel free to contact me directly. We have a LinkedIn user group, uh, a Visual Requirements uh, LinkedIn user group. Um, you can call us, drop us an email. We will be more than glad to organize a customized demo for you uh, to answer your questions. And um, if you want to evaluate this requirements and the ISO 2662 template or any of the integrations, uh, we will help you uh, build uh, the whole structure in your company or we will provide a uh, cut version or an evaluation version of the cut, anything. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's already uh, 11. Thank you very much for your time. I hope it was uh, useful and we will get back to you with the uh, slides and the recording of the presentation. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a great day.